looking back, no turning back. Amen. That's what it means to make a decision to follow Jesus. Some of those are hard. Nobody's with us or the world behind us. Those are kind of the things that are so difficult to shed sometime. But I hope that you'll decide to follow Christ with us tonight. Why don't we sing this very last song here? We just got a couple tonight. This next one's called Abide With Me. All right, it's kind of new. The words are not new, but the tune's a little different than you're used to. Abide with me fast, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide, when other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, abide with me. Bow on my head in early youth did smile And though rebellious and perverse meanwhile Thou hast not left me, though I oft left thee Unto the close, Lord Abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight, tears lose their bitterness. Where is thy sting, death? Grave thy victory. I triumph still, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross, peace, for my closing eyes shine through the gloom and point me to the sky. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's shadows flee. In life and death, Lord, abide with me. That's our first time. I hope you enjoyed it. A beautiful old hymn with some timeless words there. Why don't we open in a word of prayer tonight before you're seated. Brother Wes, are you prepared to open us a word of prayer and give us a few announcements? All right, you can be seated as Wes comes.
Okay, grab those Bibles and turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. So turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 8. As we've closed our King Me series, I just felt like I couldn't do it without talking about one of the contemporary prophets. I'll tell you what happened to me after um, taking the time um, to learn through the scriptures, the kings and the contemporary prophets. I found myself reading Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Jonah in a different light. So hopefully that will be a blessing to you as well. Um, I have put a, um, a presentation there, Lisa, on our, our thing tonight. So if you want to track along with the notes, it is there. Okay? Um, and it should be called Preventing Perpetual Sin. Let's open our Bibles. Jeremiah chapter number 8 is there. Jeremiah chapter number 8. The uh, slides may be new to some of you in here. I've created them for every sermon in the la- uh, since about... Uh, December 1st, and we've only used them like twice, but we're going to try to bring that in so hopefully you can follow along. I know that note-taking is something that we're encouraging, and so I want to help you with that, help you to follow. It's going to be um, a challenge for all of us as we try to keep up, and they try to decide when to advance the slides, but I'll try to be clear and on point. I want to begin this evening um, not with the message, but with something that uh, came up from my Sunday message about the rapture. Some of you will recall um, that we spoke on the rapture, and I was, um, I was, uh, I had some questions regarding my talk about Calvinist or Reformed theology, and I wanted to uh, just refine those for a moment, so I think it, uh, hopefully I didn't come across improperly. A couple things to note, the bastion of all millennialism um, and the post-trib rapture, the, the strongest uh, um, doctrinal teachers there are among Reformed theologians, and that's really what I wanted to get across, is that they're the major ones. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but there aren't a whole lot of other guys to talk about in true Christianity, okay? You basically have uh, Calvinists and Ar- Arminians and the people in between, and pretty much outside of that, you're getting crazy, so you're getting into cultish. So we, we speak often about those guys. Um, it's, I did not mention, say, for instance, an Arminian theology because they probably do tend toward the rapture more. Um, and uh, so I was made those comments regarding um, that Reformed theology, and that was important. And I also made those comments because in all of my life interactions, the most anti-rapture people, the most condescending toward the rapture are uh, those individuals Calvinistic. So that's why I said that last week. And uh, and that's not, that's not a, that wasn't necessarily a slight, it was a reality. Those are the people that you're going to talk to, okay? You're not going to talk to a Pentecostal about the rapture, and he's going to disagree with you. You're not going to have that problem, okay? But you will speak to, for instance, somebody that's all millennial or post-trib rapture, and the, and the generally, if you're not talking about John MacArthur's crowd of uh, Reformed theology, then you will be talking to Reformed theologians. So I, I did say that last week. But it's not necessarily a slight, it's more of, it's more of a point of interest for believers. Um, I think it's really important to know when you meet people what they believe, and so that you can address them properly, and you can understand them properly, you know. And so their theology is driven by certain ideals. For instance, we are dispensationalists. Does anybody know what a dispensationalist is? Okay, dispensationalist, dispensationalism is um, uh, where we kind of we parse the Bible, okay, and God's approach toward man by the different ages of time. And we see how God, uh, for instance, uh, we could talk about the age of innocence. That's what we classify as Adam and Eve, right, in the garden. No law except just the one, don't eat the tree, right? That was it. So then we have, of course, uh, we have the age of government. All of us know this. We talk about the, the age of Israel, when we're talking about the, the law, the age of the law, right? We're in, have you ever heard the words, we're in the age of grace, right? So the contention between dispensationalists and the covenant theologians typically has to do with the way that we classify the different periods of time. We have serious expectations, um, and, and so that, that's just a reality. So if when I bring these guys up, Somebody said, Anthony, you're almost a Calvinist. You surprise how Calvinistic you sound. And that's absolutely true. Baptists are very close to Calvinists. For instance, anybody ever heard of Spurgeon? Okay, that's right. We're, you know, the Baptist faith is found in a lot of these guys that were Calvinists, particular Baptists. But the point I'm making is, I will, when I talk about doctrine, I will address the people 
that, that use that doctrine and that you will be arguing with. And we won't bother with other people, okay? When's the last time one of you argued with a Catholic person about the rapture? It's not going to happen. You're never going to have that conversation. At least it will be so rare, it's not even hardly worth studying. But if you do talk to, for instance, a Reformed theologian, you might have a conversation about this, okay? So that's the point I wanted to make and to bring across. So um, if I was condescending, I apologize. <laughs> and if that was not clear, I try to be clear as I can in those regards. Um, and we, we definitely, as Christians, don't want to spend all our time attacking our friends, right? So we have real enemies in the world, and that is very apparent, and we're thankful to have a big group of people that believe in Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about the core fundamentals of the faith one of these days as we talk about what makes a real Christian and separates the hardcore believers from the false believers. Okay, Jeremiah, I'm sorry to put that on you, but I know, um, I know it's difficult. Sometimes I say things off the cup and cuff and tongue-in-cheek, and that's just kind of how I am, you know, if you want Someone who writes every single word of every sermon and never veers or follows a rabbit trail, you know, you, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm trying. I really am. But it's not in my nature to speak, uh, to write every word and to be really hampered by that. So I do I have a certain freedom when I preach, and you'll see that in just a moment. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 4, it says this, Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to seat and they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, that's God, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone is turned to his own course as the horse rushes into battle. Yea, the stork in the heaven knows her appointed times. And the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do approach your scripture, Lord, this day as we talk about repentance. Convict our hearts if there's any wicked way in us, Lord. Help us to be quick to repent and to avoid perpetual sin and its consequences in Jesus' name. Amen. How much more significant is the book of Jeremiah when you study it after the life of Josiah? Think about it this way. As the horse runs to the battle, that's how my people are. Anybody remember the life of Josiah? Don't go up and fight the king of Egypt. Remember what did he do? He would not turn away. And that was a minor issue. It did cost him his life, but we know that he honored the Lord and he was mourned by godly men. But when you read the king's Following Josiah, every king from Josiah to the end refused to turn away from sin. Jeremiah is written in the days surrounding the fall of Judah. And I think that that makes it more powerful. Sometimes when I was, some time ago when I would read the Bible and I would read these minor prophets, maybe as a high schooler or as a young individual, I'd read Jeremiah and I'd be like, man, this stuff is heavy. I don't want to hear about bad stuff anymore. I don't want to talk about this stuff. It's very difficult to handle this kind of scripture. But I think when you read it in light of the history and the context, it, it, it carries a, a strong significance. And that's what I'm hoping to portray. I felt like I couldn't end the King Me series without immediately reading from the prophet that the series addressed and the prophets that lived in those days. So let's open here as we talk about this. How do I prevent perpetual sin in my church and in my life perpetual sin i submit is a problem in our culture some of you will have recognized already that we have this bizarre idea that's arisen arisen among professing believers here and i've recently heard so much about maybe the last 10 years i hear it all the time maybe you'll hear maybe when i say it you'll know exactly where i'm going all sin is the 
same. I'll never forget having a conversation with a teenager in the car about gender dysphoria. And their argument was this. Have you ever told a lie? Why can't this lifestyle be accepted? Lying? An alternate lifestyle? Aren't they the same thing? And how many times have you heard a young believer substitute one of the lesser sins, uh, substitute your own greater sins, right? You, you put your scaling in there, you, you place it into the sentence, all sin is the same. And what are they ultimately saying? If God is perfect, and a lie is sin, and immorality is sin, then what's the real big difference? It's just sin, and God's perfect, and He'll forgive us. Do we hear that a lot today? Isn't that kind of the argument? And there's some sound reasoning, isn't there? If you leave out the entire law, all God's punishments for sin, and 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, where God says that there's one sin that's a sin, and there's another sin that's against the body. Actually, you sin against your own self. And then you may have heard these very words also, right? Hey, when you sin, if you, these are... Two people, they're sinning, but they're not hurting anybody. Did you ever hear that? And, we have, and what we're really talking about is, there is there's a reality here, a truth here. Every sin is the same to God's perfection, right? A lie, taking an apple off a tree that God said not to touch, was enough to keep us from heaven. But God certainly cares about sin on earth. And even more dangerous that I see in this modern thought was this. Many people are comparing a single sin to a perpetual sin. Have you noticed that? When somebody says, well, you lie, you've lied before, haven't you? Well, it's the same as me cohabitating without being married. Wait a minute. No, it's not. Because one is a sin of the moment and another is a lifestyle of perpetual sin. And this had happened in the culture of the fall of Judah. This country had come to say that sin is not something that you oops and then back and then repent and then change. They had turned to a point of perpetual sinning. This, by the way, was their downfall. Look what the Bible says here as we begin. It says here in verse number 4, thus, thus saith the Lord, shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? I was trying to think how to interpret this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it this way. You ever throw a ball against a wall? A tennis ball. What happens? It comes back. You throw a boomerang. I mean, theoretically, it comes back. I'm still having to figure out how that works, right? How about uh, what goes up must come down? These are natural agricultural people. And they look at the world in a very simple way. And so what is he saying? When you fall, what do you do next? You get up, right? That's what we do. You fall down, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you keep going. But do you know what a person that is accepting perpetual sin in their life does? They fall down and they stay down. And they're living their life in a kind of spiritual army crawl. And they're justifying perpetual sin. This is so dangerous. I want to just begin with this. Whenever we seek to justify sin... We intend to perpetuate it. Whenever a person says, oh, I know it's a sin, but I'm telling you right now, what you're telling yourself is I want to do it again. I intend to do it again. And because I have explained it away, now I can continue. Perpetuation of sin is the direct result of justification. The word perpetual here, uh, the word when we think of perpetual, we think of continuous, right? Right? Continuous, but I want to tell you that the word, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to get all of the Hebrew connotation. The Hebrew connotation here is permanence. Permanence. That is abiding 
or continual. It's something we intend not to change. That's perpetual sin in our life. And it is this same repetitive, this permanent, this perpetual sin that has become commonplace among those that claim that they are Jesus Christ's children. That they are children of the Father. And it's a very dangerous mentality because it is in fact the very attitude that destroyed the people of Israel. They came to the place where they fell and they quit picking themselves up again. So let's break it down. Let's talk about what it means to be a perpetual backslider. And then hopefully we can, we can see what we're not going to do that. We're not going to justify it this way. Let's begin as we break down perpetual backsliding. Number one, this is the first sign that you're perpetually backsliding. You dig in to deceit. Look what the Bible says as we turn. To verse number four or five, excuse me, it says, When this people of Jerusalem, why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden backwards by a perpetual backsliding? Which, by the way, um, the King James and the NASV and their counterparts are the only ones that have the words perpetual backsliding. If you have the NIV, for instance, it's not in there. It's like it doesn't say perpetual, but the words are in the, are in the Hebrew there. And it says, They hold fast what? Deceit. They hold fast deceit. You know what I think is one of the first steps into perpetual sin that we forget? It's we are no longer correctable. The prideful, you can't tell me. I've already settled this matter. Is causing perpetual sin. They've deceived themselves and they refuse to think about it. Give me an example of that. Let's see, how about Achan? Many of us know that Achan's judgment was severe. The Bible says that him and his whole family were destroyed because of the sin that he committed. And you're like, man, that is harsh. And if, but if you hear his repentance, listen to Achan's repentance, man, it's pretty good. Oh, I, Father, I have sinned. I'm so sorry I took it. I should have never took it. Why was Achan judged so harshly? Some of you will remember they're looking for the perpetrator. And they ask the people of Israel, guess who raises their hand? Sinner. Nobody. And then they do it by tribe, by family, right? And they're just getting to get a narrow and narrow group. He did, not, he did not confess his sin until he was the last person in all of Israel standing right in front of Joshua. What did he do? He not only stole from the sacred things that God the curse of things that God said, do not touch, they're mine. He not only stole, but he maintained that he would be getting away with it all the way to the last moment. I truly believe that many Christians believe they are saved, that they are godly, that they love the Lord, but they have a sin in their life, they're doing it every day, all the time, and they are going to hold on and they are not going to confess they have deceived themselves. They don't even want to consider that sin until the day that they die. I was reading a, reading a, a story about D.L. Moody, um, and again, famous guy, and he was telling about, about a man that once raised his hand in his service. And I'll read the story to you. It says, The evangelist went to him, and he said, I'm glad you have decided to become a Christian. No, said the man, I have not but you pray for me, and I will later on. I, he said he raised his hand in his service, and he thought he got saved, but when he went to him, he says, no, no, later on. His address was taken. Later, the man became ill, and Moody visited him in his home. And again, he encouraged him to accept Jesus Christ. No, said the man, I will not decide now. People will only say that I was frightened into receiving Christ while I'm sick. Anybody start to see the devil's deceit here? He didn't want to receive it right away, but now he's like, well, I can't now because people will think I'm a fake, and I don't want to do it now. The man recovered, but before long he suffered a severe relapse. Mr. Moody visited him again, and he put his need for Christ before him. It's too late, he said. 
too late for me to receive Christ. And Mr. Moody said that there is mercy even at the 11th hour. Mr. Moody said the sick man, this is not the 11th hour. It is the 12th hour. And a few hours later, he passed into eternity without Jesus Christ. We're talking not just about the sin of rejecting God. We're talking about the perpetual sin. The one that we think we're going to keep doing forever. A lie is not the same as deciding to consciously adopt a lifestyle of lying. Hatred, hating individual that hurts you, a bitterness that you confess, an angry outburst that you confess is not the same as deciding that it's okay to be bitter with someone for a lifetime or a year. But we do this, don't we? We compare a moment of sin with a lifetime of sin. Is there a difference? I was thinking about perpetual backsliding and I was thinking about that moment of sin and how today we all have temptations to ungodliness morally. Some people we're learning even now having temptations of cross-gender attraction and things like that. We were talking about this is real. It's in our world every single day. You can't even watch a commercial without seeing it. And, And we're watching this and we're saying, man, That's bad, but the Bible's very clear. One failure, a moment of temptation, is very different than choosing a lifestyle to dishonor the Lord. Gossip, I shouldn't have said that. That was wrong. I wish I'd kept my mouth shut. It's a lot different than saying, well, we just decided that it's okay, you know, because we're, you know, we we won't tell anybody. Or we're going to pray for them. Or it needs to be said. Somebody's got to tell somebody, right? Isn't that what we do? Do you see what we've done? We've gone from a sin to a sin that is now a permanent sin in our life. When we seek to justify what we have done wrong, we seek to solidify that behavior in our life. Why justify something that you'll never do again? Here's an interesting thought. Why do I justify myself? I certainly do it all the time. When somebody comes to me and calls me out, hey, I, I, I can't believe you said that to me, but let me just tell you why I did this sin. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. How many of you spend time with something you took to the dump? You spend time thinking about it, praying about it, worrying about it. You get rid of it, it's what? It's, you didn't want it in your life anymore. Why do we spend so much time justifying sin? Because we want it around, right? Isn't that, that's what I'm doing. I don't know about you, okay? I'll just tell them myself. I do this all the time. I'm justifying it because I plan on visiting it again. But the Bible says that the problem with this culture that God destroyed was what? Perpetual backsliding. How did that come about? We deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves and we do it on a permanent basis. what he says. He says, they have... They hold fast their deceit. Man, they got that and they're not letting go. They're not giving in. They will not consider that a sin. The problem is not that we we mess up, Christians. The problem is that we hold on to sin and we won't let go. Let go already and avoid the sin of perpetual backsliding. They dig into deceit. We think it's okay. Have you ever noticed how quick we are to make a list of our good works and how slow we are to make a list of our sins? Think about it this way. Your children make you mad. They dishonor you. They disrespect you. What do you say? I feed you and I clothe you and I work every day and you sit around this house. Isn't that what we do? When's the last time we get to our kids we're like, I, I ignore you. I choose television before you. Do we ever do that? Nobody does that. Nobody just stands up and rants about all the things they've done wrong. But we do rant about all the things we do right, don't we? I think this is, one of the, this is part of the deceit that we suffer. We allow ourselves to dig in 
I want to just say this. The generation today is not really asking for mercy. They're asking for God to lend total blindness to their continual faults and sins. Isn't that what's happening today? People, look, these people today in America, they're not crying out for mercy. God, forgive me. They're saying, God, why don't you, just, why don't you poke out your own eyes so you never have to see what I'm always going to do? And that's the problem. See, mercy is for people who bounce back. Shall they fall and not rise again? Will they go and not return? See, the prodigal son. What if the prodigal son, will he feign to fill his belly with those husks of corn? What if he said, eh, I've left and I'm not going back? Does he get saved? Does he find peace? Does he find repentance? But that is essentially what our generation is doing. They, th- they call mercy something that is given when there's no repentance. But the Bible is very clear. God will not have mercy on those that do not repent. So our generation calls for a constant and perpetual sin. But look out, because we have a problem. God reserved mercy for those that turn back. Number two, I want to talk about this. We, and I, I want to say this right here. I really like this verse as we look down. It says this in verse number six. I, I hearkened and heard. I hearkened and heard. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Isn't that crazy? This is what's happening. God was listening but nobody was saying the right words. Here's what, I, here's what I think is really crazy about our generation. They think that God hears everything that they say. And that's true. But here's we have another false idea, isn't it? God is always listening. But when it comes to repentance, He only hears the right words. Look what He says. No man repented of his wickedness saying what have i done see he says here i was god is always listening he hears everything that you say but you know when it comes to repentance and mercy and forgiveness god only hear those words i'm sorry i was wrong what have i done see repentance is not acceptable to god unless it's said the right way. I think this is so important. See, we dig into deceit. We think we can keep talking the same way about sin. We keep saying the same words about these untruths about God and about Jesus Christ, and he's going to excuse it, and our culture wants to do that. But watch out. Isn't that what happened here in this culture? They said, God was listening. He was always listening. Every second, every individual had the ear of God. But listen to what it says. No man said the magic words. Did your kids ever come up to you and say, I'm sorry? And you said what? For what? That's right. For what? Because nobody just goes, oh, well, that's good enough, right? I'm sorry. You're sorry for what? I'm sorry that you caught me hitting my brother. Is that going to work for you? Those words do not receive mercy because those are not the magic words. What do you say? What did you do? Say what you did. I'm sorry for what? I'm sorry for disrespecting you, mother. I'm sorry for, for not taking out of the trash. I want to hear the words because I don't get excited. I'm listening and all I hear is, my dad used to say this. I, he always said, I'm listening and all I hear is blah, 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 blah. That's what he hear all the time. He wanted the right words. I'm, not, I'm hearing you, but I'm not listening. To, I want to hear these words or know everything is white noise except those magic words. What have I done? What have I done? Boy, you want to talk about this. Um, we, first of all, they dig into deceit. They're not willing to reconsider. Don't Perpetual sin, the key to shunning perpetual sin, to preventing it, is don't dig in when you are confronted. Don't spend your time justifying your sin. God only, you could say, you could talk it all day long about how it's okay. God wants to hear these words. Are you ready? When you don't know what to say because you're in terrible sin 
and you want to confess your sins, I'll tell you what you can say. The Bible already told you. He says, what have I done? Oh man, did you ever say something like this? What did you do now? Did you ever say that? So, I, I work with a few people, and you just never know what they're going to do next. And you, you, maybe you've met that guy or that gal, or you have that kid, and it's like, oh, they're coming storming in the house again. So they did something this time. What did Lexi do now? What did Lizzie do? What did Tyson You know what I'm saying? You do that? You say those things? You know, somebody, what do they do now? The Bible's clear here. Actually, that's the question we should be asking ourselves. What have I done? Think about the prodigal son, Luke 15, 21. What did he say? And the son said to him, Father, I like this. He's going to tell you what he did. I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. How many of you think you covered it? Those are the words that God longs to hear. He wants you to say what you've done. Don't dig into deceit. Number two, here's another problem. Here's one of those things that leads into perpetual sin that God talks about. They didn't feel a thing. Are you ready? Didn't feel a thing. Look at our text here. Back to our text in Jeremiah chapter number 8. He says this. They hold fast deceit and they refuse to return. That word return there is the word that we typically use for repentance, the word turn back or turn around. But look a little later in verse number 8. Or excuse me, verse number uh, um, 6. Where am I? I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. That's what God, by the way, God is listening, but he only hears those words, the right words. No man repented him of his wickedness. I want to just tell you right now, repentance doesn't work if you don't feel anything. Repentance doesn't work if you don't feel anything. And this is something that's really important to God. You must, and, and you must feel it. And you're saying, that's kind of a stretch. Let me just tell you right now, you know this word for repentance is the word that's also used for pity and sorrow. It is not about the turning back repentance only. It gives the connotation of the sorry, the the feelings of repentance. You know, one way to live in perpetual sin is to sear that conscience so that you go beyond feeling. Remember that verse? They're being past feeling, the Bible says. You can't, you cannot come back to God. I'm sorry. How many of you ever did that? Your kids come to you and they tried that. Did you believe it? Did you buy it? <sighs> sorry for hitting in the face. <laughs> no. No, you're going to at least pretend like you care. You know, I teach all my kids to be actors when it comes to apologizing. Don't you? Didn't you get taught that by your parents? Say it like you mean it. God said that, by the way. He didn't just say, say the words, what have I done? It says, repent there. That word means to be sorry. It means to show that repentance, an emotional repentance. It's a heartfelt repentance. It's a spiritual repentance. You feel something. Christians that are in the sin, the perpetual sin, the permanent sin in their life, they stop feeling. They are doing something that God hates, that He abhors, that He destroyed generations for, that He that is so contrary to His nature, He can't even look at it. He had to turn away even from His own Son because of that sin. And they don't feel a thing. Happy as clams, living their way in the world, and they think it's A-OK with God. See, they stop feeling somewhere along the way. They stop hurting when they sin. Man, if you ever do sin and you don't feel anything, you better watch out. Right? You start, you should always feel uncomfortable when you're saying something wrong. You should always feel uncomfortable when you're doing something wrong. You should always feel uncomfortable when you're seeing something wrong. This is supposed, this is part of the natural Christian reaction, but they were past that perpetual sin. It doesn't feel, they don't feel a thing, man. 
It's all good here. I don't know what you're worried about. Man, that's so dangerous. Destroyed their culture. Ezekiel 18.28 says this. Ezekiel 18.28. Because he considers and turns away from all his transgressions that he has committed, he shall surely live and not die. What does he say? Because he considers and turns away. God wants your consideration as well as your obedience. I was thinking about what David said. He said in verse of 2 Samuel 12, 13, he said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. See, what have I done? God is looking for that repentance. People that don't repent, they can't say, I'm sorry. All right, how many of you think our politicians today are in danger of perpetual sin? They can lie without, with, with a totally straight face. One man can run saying, I promise I will not stop that pipeline. He walked in the first day, signed the thing, and smiled as big as you, the biggest smile you ever saw. And it's not just one side that does this, right? We have, you know, we're in a culture where don't you dare admit when you're wrong. That's bad publicity. Don't say when you messed up. And this is, a, this is not one part of our culture. This is not one party. This is not one kind of church or denomination. This is happening everywhere. We don't say when we're wrong. We don't, we don't show when we're wrong. We don't show true sorrow. And, we, and the, the Bible says God is not pleased that perpetual sin, the sign is this, that they did not speak it right and they did not repent. That is, be sorry or pity in their heart of his wickedness. There's no feeling anymore. It says this in Isaiah 115, he said, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. And when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. People think today, they say, man, God is merciful. Yes, but he is not blind. You will not strike God with eternal blindness with your sins. Someday there will be a reckoning between who God is and what we do. And we ought to fear that day. And perpetual sin is, is it's drive, driving us farther and farther away from the Lord. I thought about this. As I read here, let's go down. It says, what have, what have I done? No man, he repents of his wickedness in his heart, saying, what have I done? He says, everyone is turned to what? His own course. Man, this is so dangerous. One of the scariest things is in, in this culture today is everybody wants to go their way. I'll have it my way. Right? I mean, that's, that's the theme song of America. I want my way. I'm going my path, my course. But here he says, we have a problem, don't we? Like a horse into battle. Just for a moment, consider that thought, like a horse into battle. I think a lot of people think that when they go their own course, they're the writer but they're not are they they're the written look at ephesians 2 2 turn there with me what a great verse this is so important for christians as we talk about perpetual sin remember this when you ride your own course you're not the rider you're the horse see what happens there we think we're the master of our own destiny. Look what Ephesians says. Where in time past you walked according to what? The course of this world. What do you mean it's not your course? You mean it's a worldly course? It's the same one I've been plotting. Sin has been plotting for thousands of years. Yep, same one. According to the prince and the power of what? The air. That's right. You're not riding into the battle. Satan is riding you into the battle. You tell me, when a man rides his horse into battle, that horse, that's, is that where he wants to be? Is that where he was born to be? Right? Is, there, is, he, is that what he, do you think that that, what happens if that horse gets killed? That guy's going to get right on the next horse and he's going to ride that one into battle too. Expendable. 
a tool. That's what the unbeliever is in the hands of That's what the perpetual sinner is. They think they're riding their own wave. No, the Satan is riding. They're the surfboard, not the surfer. And we have this illusion of independence, this illusion of power, this illusion of decision and direction. But we are the slave. The horse, so powerful. And yet enslaved to the will of these weak humans and driven into battle. Ultimately because of his ignorance or broken spirit. Lastly, We've talked about how some people, we dig into deceit, right? We dig into deceit. We talked about we don't feel anything. I'll just say this last thing. Sin without repentance is downright unnatural. I added this one because I just couldn't believe it. The Scripture is so strong in this. Look at 8.7. It says this. The stork in the heaven knows her appointed times, the turtle and the crane and the swallow. We, We covered a whole lot of stuff, didn't we? A variety of birds as well as a reptile. All of these know their appointed times. But he says this, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. I'm telling you, the way that Americans decide what sin is, if you're listening today and you're not a Christian or you don't believe the Bible, I'll just right now tell you right now, the way that you believe that God is is downright unnatural. It's ridiculous. We are looking at God and we are making these assumptions about Him that are totally unsupported by practical logic. We're living like, like God doesn't care about us. What are you talking about? If God's perfect and you're not, does anybody see a conflict here? Isn't there going to be a conflict? That's so simple. But we're living, he's saying, look, even the animals know their place. They know their purpose and they know the design. And they, they understand, but people, man, with all, for all of our brains, we are the stupidest animals on earth, aren't we? Isaiah 1.3 says the ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know and my people do not consider. What is he saying? Of all the beasts of the field, we are the, re- we are the least natural. Man, you talk about nature. Talk about environmentalism and the green agenda. How come nobody talks about how against nature sin is? How unnatural it is for a Christian to live contrary to God's nature on a daily basis and accept it as a permanent fixture in his life. Listen to this. I don't know this guy, but I like what he said. Paul Coelho, he says this. A mistake repeated more than once is a decision. A a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. I'll remember, I'll never forget as a young man, walking along the beach and, and being taught. It's not the first time you see, it's the second look that's wrong. You don't, look, you, you don't know when you're going to be tempted, but don't go back, right? And this is what we're dealing with today. We are, oops, I sinned. Oops, I sinned. I mean, I don't know why I'm saying oops, because I literally planned this one, right? And, and, but but oh, it's a mistake. Mistakes are not what you plan to do. Man, a lot of us have been caught up in situations where we wanted to do right, we planned to do right, and the devil, man, he hornswoggled with us, right? I mean, he totally baffled us and bamboozled us, and we're just like, I can't believe I'm here. How did this happen? That happens. But we're living in a culture today where people are literally planning to sin. They're putting on their calendar, and they're saying, oops, God's not going to tolerate these kind of mistakes. That's what you're asking for is not mercy. It's blindness. Don't get caught up in this culture that wants Christians to not care about sin. To not believe. To pretend like every sin is the same, which it is, unless you do it a million times without even considering. Because what we're doing is unnatural. It's unnatural for humanity. It's unnatural for Christianity. Don't let yourself do the same thing over and over on purpose and believe it's okay with God. What we're asking for is not mercy. It's blindness. What we're making is not mistakes. It's decisions. That 
is what destroyed this great nation. This godly people, they wouldn't listen. They dug in to the deceit. They, they wouldn't allow themselves to feel conviction. Right? Don't feel a thing. And lastly, they just pursued this unnatural course of action. They've fallen and they can't get up. No, no. They've fallen and they won't get up. And that's really scary. Some people do fall and they can't get up. And we know that Jesus Christ is so necessary. His power just to change us and to transform our lives is so important. Some of you know you are so deep in a sin. You needed Christ to rescue you in a miraculous way. But what happens when you have the Holy Spirit? Or when you know it's right, and you're going right down that same road on purpose again. We call that perpetual sin. Perpetual sin. Lastly, I just want to just leave you with this story. Some of you know what the Hawaiian Islands are, right? Discovered by Captain Cook. You know how he discovered it, right? See, the Hawaiian Islands were discovered by Captain Cook, but especially we credit the Tahitians and the Polynesians, right, to be the ones that actually found it. It's estimated that the Polynesians, if they did find Hawaii by boat, it took them around 500 years. Even with Captain Cook, it wasn't a mistake that he stumbled upon it. There was a bird called the golden, I hope I'm saying this right, plover. But at any, at any rate, this bird would set out to the north going nowhere. Now, the people on these islands, they, were, they, they recognized, and Captain Cook talks about this, they recognized that here's this bird, and they always have baby birds, but they're not, they're not laying their eggs anywhere that they know of. But every year, these birds, they set out in this direction. 2,500 miles was the distance that these birds travel by nature over the sea. They estimate that as the Tahitian people were trying to find it, of course, we know with evolution and a lot of history, it's very difficult to know. They're extrapolating. They're, say, they're guessing that if these people followed the bird as far as they could and lost sight of it and had to come home and did this continually, it would take them up to 500 years to discover Hawaii. But ultimately, the person that's credited with discovering Hawaiian Islands, he did it with some Tahitian guides following this bird. Natural. God put inside of that bird direction and discovered one of our favorite vacation spots. And I'll just say, when people think they're going to find heaven without repentance, that's downright unnatural. You follow your heart, the conviction of your heart towards sin. Compare God and who the Bible says He is to what we are doing. Not only to what we are doing, but what we are planning to do on a consistent basis. And ask yourself, will God be okay? with perpetual sin. Is all sin the same? And I say, no. Don't let it be said. Don't let it be received. Don't let the younger ge generation grow up thinking that it's true because it's not. It's a lie. And it's a lie from the devil. And that lie has driven many a Christian to his death in battle, not as the rider, but as the beast. Let's pray. And as we go to prayer, we have some time for prayer requests, but I've preached a little bit longer message tonight, and since I've done that, I'm going to ask that if you have a prayer request, that you'll begin by just praying for that person. Just pray for them, and then 